Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time so that you don't have to. Today we head deep into the Underdark, that fantastic terrain below the surface of the world of Toril, beneath the bustling cities, forests and plains, under the most recent ruins of ancient empires, beneath the excavations of the surface races, the near impregnable halls of the industrious dwarves, beneath the cold and dry tunnels and caves of the upper Underdark. We start to see forests of fungus, unique subterranean species, a richer ecosystem, and the first of the races who call this realm of darkness their home. Here we have the Drow Elves, their cities built into huge caverns with stalactites and stalagmites carved into fortified citadels, housing their noble houses. On the outskirts of their territory, the lawless land of escaped slaves, monstrous creatures, and lurking mysteries of ancient times. Nestled among these places, there are the lakesides, chasm walls, and twisting warrens of the Snurf Neblin, also known as the Deep Gnomes. Zwerf Neblin are serious and suspicious creatures. They survive in the Underdark by maintaining wariness of others and working hard to keep their underground society secret. It is testament to their skills at defence and concealment that the Drow Elves consider Deep Gnomes to be some of their most formidable rivals in the Underdark, and there is a very long history of conflict between the two races. If you go asking the Zwerf Neblin of some account of their history though, you're going to draw a blank expression from the dusky skinned gnome because they have almost no interest in the past. To explain this a little further, I'll tell you what is known of the deep gnomes among most underdark races of a more worldly cosmopolitan experience. I will quote the Forgotten Realms Wikipedia article on the deep gnomes as it is very well researched and written. Deep gnomes lack not only a tradition of keeping records of written biographies, but they also have never developed a calendar or a method for which to track the passage of time as the drow have. To a deep gnome, the very concept of day or night is foreign, having never seen the light of the sun or the stars of the night sky. In fact, so deep-rooted is the cultural lack of timekeeping, either of the past, present or the future, that among outsiders the history of the deep gnomes amounts to little more than the history of Blending Stone, the only deep gnome settlement known of, of prevalence among non sferf Neblin. Blingdon Stone, founded in minus 690 DR by clans fleeing the Faerim beneath Netheril, grew to prominence in large part thanks to the vicinity of the infamous Drow city of Menzo Baranzan, and the less infamous but equally strong Duagua, Duaga fortress, Grachlstuk. In spite of the presence of these two mighty cities, Blingdon Stone survived for over two millennia, supported by the rich mining industry that thrived in Blingdon Stone's rich veins of Arandur and other exotic minerals. Rules. Blingdon Stone would come to ruin in the end. The way in which this occurred, in particular, however, in the uh, is peculiar. In the year of the Wanderer, the ruler of Blingdon Stone, King Schnicktik, welcomed into his city the fugitive Driss Duerden, a fugitive of Mendo Menzo Baranzan's harsh justice. Driss stayed for only a short while, but his route would later be tracked 20 years later by the vengeful army of Menzo Baranzan during the invasion of Mithril Hall in the Year of Shadows. Realizing the danger to them, the Deep Gnomes abandoned their homes and sought refuge in the darkness. After the drow passed their city largely unharmed, a group of Deep Gnome wardens led by Balwar Disengulp convinced King Schnicktick to lend his aid to Mithril Hall's defence. A large army of them uh, then marched on Mithril Hall. Oh, ironically, um, Blingdenstone was pretty much abandoned and that's why the drow uh, never settled there. T the resulting victory at the Battle of Keepersdale saved Mithril Hall but it would cost the Deep Gnomes their home. Twelve years later, in Marpenoth, the matron mothers of Menzo Baranzan launched a full-scale assault on Blingdenstone. The Deep Gnomes' defences were no match for the drow army, aided and supported by demons summoned from the abyss. Thousands perished in the siege and thousands more were enslaved by the vengeful drow. Those that escaped made their way to Mithril Hall and Silvery Moon where they are welcomed, eventually settling throughout the neighbouring area. You can also find them and find a lot of Seferf Neblin in Lurar and also um, the Bloodstone Mines in Damara. Most of that article is sourced directly from the 2003 source book called Races of Faerun. They first appeared in the game Dungeons and Dragons in first edition in the adventure modules Shrine of the Kotoa and the Vault of the Drow, both published in 1978, and then the, the original Fiend Folio in 1981. They first appeared as an optional player character race in Unearthed Arcana, published in 1985. I played more than a few of them way back then and thoroughly enjoyed myself. The Swerf Neblin appeared in second edition, for the Forgotten Realms setting in the monstrous compendium Forgotten Realms Appendix, published in 1989, which was repeated, I think, unchanged in the Monster Manual in 1993. They're also included as a player character race in the complete book of Gnomes and Halflings in 1993, as you would expect. 
They appear with gnomes in the monster manual for 3.5 edition, as well as a player character race in the Forgotten Realms campaign setting in 2001, and again in the Underdark sourcebook in 2003, which is a particularly good book, and Player's Guide to Faerun in 2004. They appear only once for 4th edition in the Dungeon uh, Survival Handbook published in 2012. For the current edition of the game, they first appear as a hostile NPC race and then as a player character race in the Elemental uh, Evil Player's Companion published in 2015, including expanded information about their culture and characteristics. This information has been repeated but not further developed in 5th edition. So, what are they like? Deep Gnomes are at home in the Underdark as they firmly believe that they were created to dwell there. You see, the Deep Gnomes were led underground peacefully by their patron god, Kaladuran Smoothhands. Most Sverf Neblin will venerate him as their own patron god, but also venerate Gal Glittergold as the primary patron deity of all gnomes. It's not mentioned in 5th edition, but Sverf Neblin have a limited form of racial telepathy that allows Deep Gnomes to communicate very basic terms and only to other Deep Gnomes, such as sending a signal that danger approaches, silently alerting any other Deep Gnomes close by but out of sight. They can also listen to the rock and earth of their home, not to the extent of some other elementally attuned underground races such as the Peck, for instance, who can talk to stone, but they are able to douse for specific minerals, know their general direction and location, and even understand the mood of a particular area. They can sense if something is supernatural evil uh, um, is going on, for instance, but, you know, it's kind of like if it's, it's strong in the dark side of the force. They are extremely stealthy able to blend into the rocky terrain with advantage on their stealth checks. They also have natural magical affinity um, and ability, which they have advantage on intelligence, wisdom and charisma saving throws against all forms of magic, and can cast non-detection on themselves at will. This is a bit more limited than uh, other gnomes' ability to cast at will magic, but they're very much more resistant to magic than other gnomes. Once per day they can cast blindness, deafness, blur and disguise self as a spell-like ability using their intelligence attribute to determine the spell's difficulty class if applicable. As a whole, deep gnomes are hard-working and deeply sullen people. Their architecture, for instance, is shaped largely by the conditions deep gnome lives the, they live in, with the oldest homes often carved directly into the surrounding rock and highest-ranking members of any one clan usually inhabiting large stalagmites while the lower class in, uh, classes inhabit the surrounding cavern floors or walls. This is not a hard social division though. They have a kind of a meritocracy where those with many years of experience and truly great talent live and work the closest to the well-protected workshops and schools and the, the large stalactites, which are usually located um, in these fortified areas of deep stone. The homes of deep gnomes are comfortable but stark. They appreciate carvings with interesting contrasts of light and dark, but gaudy displays of colour which they would not even be able to see most of the time living in very dim or dark, totally dark conditions are um, alien to them. Deep Gnome cuisine is also a reflection of their livelihood with the common staples made up of a variety of exotic fungi found only in the Underdark. Other common foodstuffs include blind fish or occasionally a deep roast made of roth, goat or sheep. Perhaps because the fire produces unwanted light and smoke, the Deep Gnomes prefer to salt their food instead of cooking it, which makes most Sverf Neblin food particularly practically inedible to outsiders. I mean, it's basically a salt lick. For drink, most Deep Gnomes drink a salty spirit made of fermented fish, which, like Sverf Neblin food, is an acquired taste. On occasion, Deep Gnomes prefer drink of a more tolerable drink called uh, Gogan Gogondi, said to can be contained in powerful ruby and grant uh, powerful visions to those who drink it. <laughs> Although far more serious than most gnomes, Deep Gnomes nonetheless exhibit some insatiable curiosity and craftiness if pushed if uh, put in the right circumstances. It's this trait, more than any other, which leads Deep Gnomes to abandon their cautious upbringing and explore the world around them. Some of these wandering Deep Gnomes turn upwards, investigating the surface world from which their ancestors came. And from their perspective, it's kind of like uh, scaling a mountain peak, because they live in relatively hot, warm conditions deep underground. And the upper underdark is cold and stark and dry, like an alpine waste to them. So they pack their food, put on uh, sturdy boots and, and nice warm clothing in order to make the arduous trek way up into the surface world. Uh, coming out on the, the 
the surface world for them is like cresting a mountain peak and suddenly seeing the vistas of the outside world around them. All deep gnomes who wander beyond their cities share the deep curiosity that allows them to overcome their hard-bred caution and shyness. Although other motives such as economic drive or a desire to find an aid in a fight to help um, against a threat that the deep gnomes cannot conquer them on their own may also play a part in their departure. Deep gnomes are surly. They're quiet and cynical people. They have to be. Life in the Underdark can be very harsh. The sound of voices can attract predators to one's doorstep, so they have learned to keep their voices low and their attitude grim. They take loss in their stride. They do not get overly attached to things and give their loyalty and friendship only after their trust has been earned, often hard-earned. But they make incredibly loyal and stalwart, stalwart companions to those who they call friend. They would never betray a friend's trust and share anything that they have if asked. Sullen and hardworking, yes, but deep gnomes are wholly dedicated to any task they set themselves on. Although outsiders find deep gnomes' overly serious attitude to make for sour company, these qualities make them tireless pursuers of excellence in their metal workings and weapon forging. They are also quite brutal towards the delicate sensibilities of or possessiveness of other races. For example, I had a character I played in one game and used as a non-player character in a couple of other campaigns. He was a cleric of one of the gnome gods, in this case, Gelf Dark Earth, uh, introduced in Races of Stone. Gelf is Gaal Glittergold's brother and is the deity of entropy and revenge. I came up with a really great clergy and a set of rituals for the religion of Gelf, and this deep gnome character was very devout. Like most Verfneblin, he was between 3 and 3 foot 6 uh, feet, or 91 to 110 centimetres, and weighed between 40 and 45 pounds, or 18 to 20 kilograms, so quite small, with a lean and wiry build, only very sparse wiry grey hair and brownish grey skin with uh, black or grey eyes. He also had an unusually large nose, even for a Svef Neblin, who can have quite big noses in proportion to the rest of their face. This cleric was named Schnickledick, and had the holy symbol of a small black iron anvil, and carried a very sturdy warhammer. When asked for divine healing or any other sort of favour granted to him by Kelf, he would ask for some precious object from the person asking for the favour, then take it and smash it into flattened bits on his sacred anvil. See, Gelf stands in opposition to everything his, Gal, his brother Gal stands for. He doesn't delight in destruction, uh, Gal delights in creation and beauty. Um, so Gelf grimly demands it of, uh, the destruction of it from his clerics who live lives of abstinence and poverty and will usually gather congregations which are little better than thieves guilds uh, except they steal beautiful and precious artworks and relics just to smash them into utter ruin for their god the number of times schnickledick caused a real emotional torment to players as they had to choose some object that meant a lot to their character just to watch this gnome pounded into a nugget in front of them before he would heal their wounds was absolute role-playing gold. He's still one of my favourite non-player characters of all time. Galf's holy symbol is a broken anvil set on a smoky uh, purple background, so be advised, clerics of that god demand things more valuable than coins and gems for their services. Erdlin, the gnome deity of greed and blood, was first detailed in Roger E. Moore's article The Gnomish Point of View in Dragon No. 61, published in 1982. His clerics worship him in underground caverns where they make dark sacrifices of blood and gems, which all gnomes, including Svirf Neblin, find precious. I often depict this love of gems in the same way I depict the obsession that draconic beings and dwarves have an unhealthy obsession with gold. When dealing with gnomish merchants, they will exchange their bartering uh, change their bartering tactics if the characters are trying to buy or trade with gemstones as their currency as gnomes value jewels above all other treasures as you would expect from the dour deep gnomes they tend to love the gems that have the highest practical value so they have an abiding love of diamonds uh, Sekojan Earthcaller is another gnome deity of earth and nature that the gnome, deep gnomes venerate unlike Bear Van Wildwanderer who is a god of plants and forests of the surface world. Sergo Jan's area of uh, concern is the deep earth and the life within it. He's said to have given the gnomes their ability to communicate with burrowing animals, uh, particularly mammals. His symbol is a glowing gemstone. Usually this is a finely cut gem of any type in which illusion spells have been cast to provide magical light. This can be any gem, but Sergo Jan is associated strongly with diamonds. The god's power makes these spells permanent as long as they are carried by his priests, and his sacred animal is the badger. 
Deep gnomes are much like their surface cousins and they live in harmony with the animals of the deep. They are able to ride giant beetles, some spiders, lizards and other sightless creatures that resemble hairless goats. They can also tame and ride giant bats. While they reach maturity very quickly by gnomish standards, being adults at the age of 20, they still have a long lifespan. span. Reaching two centuries is fairly common if they've not died due to their sometimes violent and extreme environment. They have just as much individual flair and creativity as their surface kin, though you wouldn't be able to tell by looking at them. It's quite subtle in comparison. They may also wear dull and practical clothing, but it will be finely fashioned to their own unique style. Their smithing tools, weapons and armour will all have a telltale style. Other deep gnomes will be able to recognise if it's from a particularly well-known master crafter, while not impairing the item's practical function one iota. Like other gnomes, deep gnomes prefer the use of illusion to other schools of magic. However, while this is simply a cultural preference among rock gnomes who are fond of practical jokes and games, it's a method of survival for deep gnomes. In addition to knowing the relatively simple invisibility spell, most gnome illusionists are familiar with a great wealth of ancient and forgotten lore recovered from ancient ruins that scattered the Underdark. For what records they do keep will typically be spell books and ritual books. Deep gnomes really understand this knowledge fully, but that hardly matters. They are willing to use it in any way that they can. For, for them, magic is a deeply practical uh, practice of survival. Deep gnome wizards who aren't illusionists are frequently diviners, using their spells to locate and find mat- materials essential to survival. Uh, most magic items forged by deep gnomes are disguised as jewellery, which is relatively common amongst the gem-loving Sverf Neblin. Of all the lords of the Golden Halls, which is the gnomish pantheon's home, deep gnomes feel the strongest ties to uh, Kaladur and Smooth Hands, as mentioned, the Master of Stone, who deep gnomes generally see as her protector and divine benefactor, as mentioned. Um, and he, of course, sees them as his personal wards. According to Sverf Neblin myths, it was Kaladurin who taught the Deep Gnomes to summon and befriend Earth Elementals, and the Deep Gnomes honour him by carving his holy, holy symbol into their art, with the exception of Golden Rings, which is seen as a taboo. Only two holidays are commonly celebrated amongst the Deep Gnomes, quiet and reserved that they are, the rest created on a whim by local priests, and are both in honour of Kalimdurin. The first, the Festival of the Ruby, celebrates the myth that Kalimdurin hid the rubies of the world in the earth for the deep gnomes to find, and it is considered a day where searches really come up empty. The second holiday, the Festival of the Star, honours the Master of Stone as a continuing protector of the deep gnomes. As part of their festival rites, deep gnomes gather along the shores of subterranean lakes to watch small phosphorescent fungi light up the cavern ceilings in a visage similar to that of a night sky reflecting in the water. As much as this is in honour of Kalandurin, whose holy symbol is a star, it is cons- a constant reminder of the deep gnomes of the origins of the surface world, and that they are not alone. So when they look into a, the glimmering of a gem's light from a diamond reflecting back sparkles of brilliant rainbow hues, they're thinking of the night sky and the souls of the gods up above. Children are an extremely important part of deep gnome society, as part due to the low birth rates relative to the dangers of the Underdark among the Deep Gnomes, uh, who usually have fewer than four children and rarely more than six in their entire life of two centuries. Deep Gnomes mothers dote on their children obsessively, but not in such a way that it inhibits their growth or gives them mental problems. When they reach adolescence, Deep Gnome children are immediately apprenticed to masters who take over their wardship in whatever trade they're expected to take on. Adulthood is less defined amongst deep gnomes than among their kin, with maturity commonly agreed upon by the time at which a deep gnome starts working full time. Most gnomes, uh, male gnomes, are miners or gem cutters, while females are masters of the home, birthing and raising children while keeping the house tidy and meals prepared. It's important to note that male and female deep gnomes are not considered unequal. Rather, males are masters outside of the home and females are masters within. What the female says about the home and hearth is law. Uh, this concept of equal labour for, uh, for either sex carries on the way to the top of the Snerfeblin society, where each city is governed by a king and queen who rule as co-equals. The king is often the head of the community's mining operations and defences, while the queen is tasked with ensuring that the community has enough food and water to survive, while also handling the day in uh, the daily in and out bureaucracy. Significantly, the king and queen rarely are married to one another, but instead come to their positions independently, elected for life upon the death of their predecessor. 
regardless of gender, there is no true conception of retirement among deep gnomes who work until they are physically no longer able to work. Deep gnomes may have a reputation as dour and evil versions of surface gnomes among surface dwellers, in part because of the evil nature of the drow and the duergar. But this is actually a race of good hearts and a deep sense of community. They prefer to keep to themselves, and this can be mistaken as being xenophobic or antisocial, but they are simply introverts who quietly ponder the wisest course of action. Um, action, pay careful attention to their environment and work away studiously at their various crafts and projects. They can be relied on to leap to the aid of their allies, even at great personal risk to themselves, and that, in the Underdark, is a very rare quality. Like, subscribe, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos, buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride, check out Patron Blades for a mighty smooth shave, and as always, Thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.